Now we're going to go back in the book of Romans and bring in some very vital things. First of all, the immoral man in the book of Romans had 19 things listed about him. 19 things. Some of the things that the immoral man had listed was whispering, gossip, as well as homosexuality. They were all placed in the same category. The immoral man had 19 things that he was labeled for in Romans 1, 18 to 32. The 19 things are characterized in six verses in that section of the Bible. Well, the moral man then immediately said, I don't appreciate this. I am moral and therefore I will certainly be able to meet God and go to heaven. So the moral man then opens his mouth too wide and the Apostle Paul shows him seven things that are going to happen to him. And the first thing that's going to happen to him is this. On the basis that he says one single word judging the immoral man, immediately he establishes forever how he is going to be judged. The moment you judge a single person, you have set up the rest of your life how you're going to be judged. Very interesting thing. So the moral man is going to be judged. He will face seven different judgments. And perhaps the greatest judgment of all that he will face will be when his works, they are judged according to God's Son's works. The White Throne Judgment is simply everybody's works being acknowledged, being recognized, being accepted as works. However, the problem is they are judged by Jesus Christ's works. And if one of them falls short of Jesus Christ's works, of course, and they all do, and that may help you on what the works judgment is all about in Revelation 20, 10 to 15. And this is the great problem of the moral man. God says to him, any righteousness that you have doesn't even compare to the works of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are all filthy rags. And you better be found in your, my righteousness and not any portion of yours. So the moral man has seven different judgments that he uh, has to face. And it's the last judgment of the moral man, and by the way, many of you don't know what I'm going to tell you right now, and you get twisted up when you read it. The last thing that the moral man, from 1 to 16 in Romans 2, is going to be judged for is his secret sins, mental sins. By the way, everybody isn't going to be judged for their secret sins. Many times evangelists will get up, and I won't mention names, but people will get up and preach a red-hot sermon on secret sins will be judged at the, white, at the uh, Beamer seat. No, they will not. Romans 2.16 is dealing with the seventh judgment of the moral man. In other words, God finally exposes that guy who judged everybody under the sun and he set up his own judgment and God is going to bring out every secret sin he's ever committed and say you're guilty you so-called moral man then the religious man in Romans 2 after the moral man now you have the immoral man in Romans 1 18 to 32 he has 19 things he does in particular in that list then you have the moral man, and he is judged for seven judgments. And some of them, if you, if you define them there and study it for yourself, they're very interesting. Seven judgments. The first judgment we repeat is when he opens his mouth, he is setting up a standard of how he's going to be judged in the details of life. And God will give him a real dose of his own judgment. That, by the way, 
One of the great problems of David, David, first of all, lied. He was hypocritical. He was an adulterer and a murderer. But the real problem with David is when he decreed to Nathan the judgment of that person that did what he did and didn't know he did it. When Nathan gave the story of somebody stealing one person's little lamb, and David got angry and he said, he should die. Well, that was a very wrong thing to do. Because the judgment on that would be the child would die, Ammon, the first son, would die, Absalom would die, and Adonijah would die. Uh, David set up that judgment. God said, oh, that's, that's the judgment that there should be, right? And David said, that's what we're going to do. That man ought to die. Where is he? So David established his own judgment. You don't know it, but when you and I open our mouth on bad days and get that tongue going, we are causing more problems for ourselves down the road than you'd ever believe in your life. Because the, the verbal sins in Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, there are seven things that are on God's top list. Seven. Everything is sin, but these are on the top category. Three is the attitude sins that are wrong. Three verbal and one murder. So there's a lot of sins that have never made the top seven yet. But the mental attitude sins have made the top seven, three of them. And the verbal sins have made the top seven. And taking a person's life has made the top seven because you give them no opportunity to choose any longer. So, now the religious man says, that moral man ought to go to hell because he doesn't believe in God. And of course, the Jews represented the religious crowd. So the Apostle Paul immediately points out six reasons that the religious man isn't going to go to heaven. We boast in God, says the religious man. And uh, Paul said, doesn't mean a thing. It's all ritualism. It's all externalism. You've never had a transformed heart and your religion has never changed you and you're just plain religious. So you're going to go to hell also. The moral man's going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell and the immoral man's going to go to hell. And he said, let's lump it all together. All have sinned and come shy of the glory of God and that settles that and all have missed the mark and all have committed iniquity against divine government. Therefore, the law was given that every mouth may be stopped. Romans 3.19 The law of perfect, law of God was given that every single mouth should be stopped except if I sin against you, you come to me alone. If you sin against me, I go to you alone. Plus, in the table of organization, that's it. Only in the table of organization or sinning individually against a person can I, through discernment, honor the scriptures and protect uh, the word of God or as I reveal God's order. Now, you picture this for just a moment. Picture 19 things with the immoral man. The moral man gets judged in seven different ways. And the religious man is going to hell because he misunderstands six of his attributes. The truth is that men then were brought to believe this. The Jews said, well, we have some heroes of faith, and we're going to name them to you, Paul. One of them is Abraham. Now, what are you going to say about that Hall of Famer? Paul said, I'll tell you about that Hall of Famer. He was justified by faith in Genesis 12 and didn't even get circumcised until Genesis 17. And they didn't know what to say about that. It really confused him. 
And he, he understood believing without achieving. See, the religious man is judged not for his knowledge, but for his performance. If I was speeding down the highway, and I was going 70 miles an hour in a 55 zone, and they gave me a ticket, and I go to the courtroom and say to the judge, I know what the speed limit was. Is that going to make any difference? <laughs> the religious man says, I have this knowledge. That's right, but you don't have the performance of faith. So therefore, Abraham believed God, believing, not achieving, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And it was a beautiful work of God. Now, David, hypocrisy, murder, and adultery. So, the Holy Spirit selects two of the Hall of Famers and lays it right into the mind of challenging the Jews. And David would simply believe. He would be chastened, but he would believe. And a large measure of his chastening was the way he felt in the, in the story that Nathan gave him. And he, he set up a standard for his own judgment. If he kept his mouth shut, he would have minimized his judgment uh, um, immeasurably. See, if you will learn, if we learn to keep our mouth shut and let God be God, except for the table of organization, except if somebody does something individually toward us, you see, this is the way it goes. If so-and-so in, in Baltimore of another church is doing something wrong, I cannot touch him. It's none of my business. His table of organization deals with him biblically. I don't. Uh, he hasn't done anything against me, and therefore I'm left out of it. It's between him and God and his table of organization. Now, the moment they do something, they better be biblical or the second they are not biblical, they have set up how God is going to judge them and their families the rest of their life. Because Proverbs says, when you do this, when you return evil for divine good, judgment comes upon your entire household. You see, evil came upon David's entire household because he didn't judge righteously. And that's what happens. So judgment is one of the worst things that the moral man and the religious man could do is they just felt they had a right to do the judging. And that's, that's the problem with right-wing fundamentalism. It's very interesting. Um, pastors around the nation know this. When you have people turn against you in the church, if you ever unleashed what you, what you know about them through the years, they could never serve in any other place. See what I mean? They have set up a standard of judging, but you don't react or retaliate. You just turn them over to God and let God have them, because that's the way you're supposed to do it. Now, we get into verse verses 7 and 8. Now, we want you to notice verse 7. Very interesting thing in verse 7. Verse 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the, of the man unto whom God imputeth what? Imputeth righteousness without what? without works. So God here is imputing righteousness without works. Now when we believe on Jesus Christ, are we made righteous? Are we? No, we're not. When we believe on Jesus Christ, we are declared to be righteous. There's a big difference between God declaring you to be righteous 
than the fact that you have been made righteous. Well, I know what you're thinking about. You're thinking of 2 Corinthians 5.20, and I understand that, 21. However, always remember this. The ungodly sinner that's justified by faith has been declared righteous. A legal act in justification. Now, once he has been legally, judicially, declared to be righteous, then that ungodly, saved sinner of Romans 4, 4, and 5, especially Romans 4, 5b, then he can be made righteous. Now, God does not uh, declare a man righteous uh, after having made him righteous. He does not make us righteous until he's declared us righteous. So first of all, we believe, and God declares us righteous on the grounds of what he did, Jesus Christ did on the cross in his vicarious atonement, atonement when he delivered us by the paying of a price. Now, but it ne justification never means making one righteous. It means, but to account them righteous by reckoning to them God's righteousness. So reckoning to the sinner God's righteousness makes it possible on the legal acts of the vicarious atonement for God to credit that person with Jesus Christ's righteousness and therefore declare him to be righteous. It's important that you know the difference between declaring a person to be righteous and making a person righteous. All right? We are made the righteousness of God in him through the declaration of the Father, imputing to us God's righteousness without works. Now, God's righteousness is based upon propitiation. Now, in Hebrews 9, 5, you have that verse on the mercy seat. Now, picture it. If the seat of mercy had not had the blood uh, placed upon it, it would be a judgment seat. So the judgment seat, by placing the blood upon it, becomes a mercy seat. And that's a beautiful thing. Therefore, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Then we are justified. The justification means declaring sin is righteous in his sight. And then we became declared to be righteous by faith and faith alone. Now, the only way that we can ever satisfy God is if we have perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness. It has to be perfect righteousness. That's why the moral man couldn't make it. That's why the religious man couldn't make it. He had to have perfect righteousness. And the problem with the human race is, until you have perfect righteousness, you can't be saved. So God devised a plan to make us perfectly righteous by imputing to us his righteousness without works, by faith and faith alone, through grace and grace alone. So God does it through a promise, and we don't uh, receive a promise by works. We receive a promise by God, and we believe in it. Now we have something very beautiful. We have in the Old Testament, Psalm 32, 1 and 2, the story of David. And in that particular passage, Paul quotes it in Romans 4, 7 and 8. Now, blessedness, uh, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, in Psalm 32, there is no subject for the verb. Say that back to me to get your minds generating with intelligent energy. In Psalm 32, there is no subject for the verb. Now, why is, isn't there a subject for the verb? Because God wants you to write your name in there. 
In other words, put your name there and say, you're the man whose iniquities are covered, whose sins are forgiven, and you're the person whom the Lord cannot impute sin to. No subject for the verb. Now, epicalupto, E-P-I-K-L-A-L-U-P-T-O, epicalupto is strengthened from calupto. Now, calupto, K-A-L-U-P-T-O, means to hide. Uh, let's see if we can get this straight here. Well, everyone understands clearly. Here's this pen. Now, I'm going to hide the pen in the handkerchief. That's calupto. I've covered the pen up. Let the pen represent your sins. In the Old Testament, sins were covered, but not removed. Now we have the epicalupto. Now this means the removal of the sin plus the wrath plus the guilt. In other words, this is what happened. On Calvary, Jesus Christ removed what had been covered throughout the entire Old Testament. In the Old Testament, your sins were covered, but they were not removed. The moment he died, the just for the unjust, all of their sins were not only covered, but they were what? Removed. And with the removal of the sin, they were hid from God's eyes. In Isaiah 65, 16b. And therefore, the wrath was removed. The penalty was taken away. How many understand that? So it's a very special thing. Now, many people today treat sinners without realizing that God has removed their sins and removed the wrath going way beyond just covering them. That's why you don't have a right to bring up any sin that you've repented of. You don't have any right to go to a counselor and talk about it. You're very stupid and very ignorant. People reject Christ because of ignorance, because of pride, and because of morality. People reject finished work because of ignorance, and they reject it because of ignorance and because of fear and legalism. So they reject the absolute truth of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, when God had Solomon named through David and Bathsheba, they gave him a very personal name to go along with what we know him as, Jedidiah. And Jedidiah means because of Yahweh. In other words, Bathsheba is placed in the genealogical line of Christ in Matthew 1.6. Solomon's the wisest man of the earth that replaced the baby that died through chastisement because of David setting up a standard of judgment. So they get in this amazing thing that I'm going to give you Solomon and I'm going to put Bathsheba in the genealogical line for Yahweh's sake. Everything the father does is for Yahweh's sake. Not for mine. For Yahweh's sake. Why? Because Yahweh in his Expiation. His, the expiation, remember, means the son died for the sake of the father. Expiation, Jesus died to satisfy the, the justice of the father, the righteousness of the father. Don't ever confuse expiation and propitiation. Expiation is Jesus did it for Yahweh's sake. Propitiation, he did it for my sake. 
but I must have propitiation after expiation. Propitiation being the mercy seat of Hebrews 9, 5 and Romans 3, 24. Now, I want you to notice this, that in this passage, the whose sins, Romans 4, 8, Blessed are they whose, they whose sins or iniquities are forgiven. Now that means that the rebellion against divine government has been uh, forgiven. The alienation throughout the entire unsaved life. All that rebellion, which relates to iniquity, has been forgiven. Uh, it comes from a beautiful word, a femi, and it's an aris paris passive indicative. From apo from, apple, A-P-O, from, and then we have Jaime, to send. So it means to send away, to put away from. This means then that the iniquities have been separated from the sinner. Then it says, and who sins? This is the coordinating conjunction chi, both kinds of sins, uh, anomia, and Hamadia are equally forgiven. Now, one includes all sins that one could ever commit in an, in an act. It's willfully an intentional sin and includes with it guilt. Now, that's totally forgiven. But the other is used as a sin such as the nature of man, his singular nature, his old sin nature. And that's taken care of and forgiven. So all the sins we've been committed have been removed from us and positionally the old sin nature has been removed from us. So we have then A-N-O-M-I-A and H-A-M-A-I-T-I-A. They are equally forgiven. The root and the fruit, the sin and the sins, the cause and the effect. And that is a beautiful thing that God has done in his mercy and in his compassion. Our covered, we mentioned, is epicalupto. It's an aorist passive indicative. It's happened in the past. We can receive the action, and it's a dogmatic act. You don't have to be counseled about it. They are covered over so as not to come into view, and then they were removed when Christ died on the cross. Then verse 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, will not account sin to is an aris middle uh, subjunctive. An aris middle subjunctive. It's a double negative here because he will not put it to one's account and therefore he can never charge that person with what he's done. So he will not put it to the account and will not charge the person with what they've done. And the person will receive the action of not having his sin on God's record books and the middle voice. That's the middle voice. Plus, he will receive the action of never being charged for his sin. So you see, a middle voice here is a very precious thing. We've told you in the past few days, the direct middle is when the subject receives the action of the verb and the regular middle is when the subject makes a decision with the verb. So, Logizomai is the word for impute. Sin here means all sins that you've ever committed. It refers to all sins as an individual act. It's willful, intentional, and produces guilt. So God has removed it, and that's why you, as a subject, can write your name in there and be extremely very, very happy. That's a very beautiful thing that Paul should use for all of this, Abraham. Most scholars feel that Abraham spent 30 hours with God in a row. And it's a very exciting thing. He spent 30 Hours, some of them under the stars, and God just spoke to him and spoke to him and spoke to him. 
And God said, listen, I'm your shield. Started out by saying, I am your shield. Abraham knew that he meant protection. Then he said, I am your exceeding great reward. And Abraham knew that he meant that he would be uh, Abraham's, that God would be his satisfaction. I mean, his reward would be God. His reward would be Christ. It would come to him as a great satisfaction. Then God showed Abraham amazing things. He, he showed him that a couple of birds... And uh, the birds represented that that would come from heaven. And they, uh, these would represent a symbol of love. There would be a young pigeon which would represent the humanity of Christ on the earth. Then he would show them beasts, and that would be sacrifices from the earth. Sacrifice from heaven was represented by the birds. The beasts would represent sacrifices from the earth. Then he showed Abraham an amazing thing. He showed him a she-goat. And the she-goat would stand for the sin offering. Christ would be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteous of God in him through the declaration of God in justification. Then he showed him a heifer. And a heifer meant someone that willfully subjects himself into obedience. Then he showed him the ram, the ram which was uh, also devoted to consecration in the will of God. The ram that someone that is devoted to the will of God and delights in the will of God. And Abraham had all of these things taught him in 30 hours that he and God had an interview before he became the official. Uh, man that would go on to be circumcised after he was saved, etc. But then God showed him something else. He showed him birds coming down with all the sacrifices that were there, and these birds would sweep down to spoil the sacrifices. He was going to receive from the Holy Spirit the most amazing lessons. He was going to learn that there's a sacrifice from above. He's going to learn that animal sacrifices from below was to point to it. He was going to learn what each animal sacrifice meant in relationship to Jesus and to him as a man of faith before God. He was going to learn that demons and dirty birds would try to consume and eat and spoil the sacrifices. You understand all this? Then he showed them a furnace in a dream. And in his furnace, furnace, he saw people put into fire. And God was teaching uh, Abraham that the Jews would be in the fire of Egypt and Babylon. And it was his own people that would be judged in fire. So God was very, very gracious and very kind and very careful to show uh, Abraham all these things as the father of our faith. Now, having understood these things, I want you to notice this. If you understand this this morning, and you completely and totally understand it, it totally, completely changes your humility. It changes my humility. Why? Because I realize from God's viewpoint who I am. Who I am. I'm a nobody that has believed God. I've come under the legal act of being declared righteous. Number two, Jesus Christ, because of my faith in him, has promised me that I'm just as righteous as he is without one single merit. And that's the most incredible thing in the world. I'd faint and die 25 times if it wasn't in the Bible. It would be so arrogant if it wasn't right here. The moment you believe, you receive the garment of righteousness in Isaiah 61.10. Then you're declared righteous, Romans 3.25. Then God imputes righteousness without works, Romans 4.6. 
and see the reason God cannot impute sin to us is because he's already imputed his righteousness. See, he imputes righteousness, that's his own righteousness, and that's the only way we can ever enter into heaven. So the only reason that he can't impute sin, it's impossible for him to impute sin, that's why you have the double negative, it's impossible to charge us with anything, is because he has given us a garment or a robe of perfect righteousness, which we receive by believing on him without achieving. So it's an incredible thing that, that a child of God now has a brand new meaning of life, a brand new reason for living, a brand new point of reference. You see, that is a new point of reference. And it develops for me a new frame of reference. My point of reference is, I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I've been declared to be perfectly righteous. Number two, I don't have to be put on a performance program even though my faith will honor God in the fruit of the Spirit and we will name any sin and repent and hate sin because of the indwelling nature of God. Number three, God can never ever impute a single sin to me as long as I live. He will chasten me if I break his fellowship and spank me in his loving chastisement to bring me back to him again. But this all teaches us the glorious meaning of what faith does alone, apart from everything else, and what grace does alone, apart from any works. For by grace through faith are you permanently saved, perfect tense. You've received the action for it, and you are saved forever, and not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, having understood these things, many people just plain, consistently set up their own standards of judging people. In other words, everybody that I've met in this ministry loves this message. Newcomers are coming out all the time because they love this message. But the most dangerous thing with this message is to accept it for yourself and be quick to judge others according to your own self-righteousness. Make others pay while you give yourself liberation through grace. In other words, resist and resent and react to others because that's the normal thing in the heart of man. And that's the very moment we do that we enter into double judgment because we are responsible for our new freedom. We are responsible for our new emancipation. And if God has given us all this, why would we ever want to judge anyone else? We will be faithful to deal with the table of organization. We'll be faithful to deal with the individual thing that they do against us to restore them back to fellowship, that being the motive. Or if they refuse that, then we'll be faithful to honor the word of God to protect the body. But we must realize that when God said to David, I will give him a lamp for my servant's sake, that lamp that God uh, said he was going to give through David speaks of testing discipline under a divine government. If you study that out for two or three hours, you'll come up with a simple statement when God said, I will give David a lamp for my servant's sake, he means I will give him trials, I will give him testings, and I'll give him discipline through a divine government. Now, I never knew that lamp related to that in that context, but it does. And that's what God does when he tries the hearts and the motions of his people through the details of life. Uh, he's protecting your lamp, which is your human spirit, and if your lamp is your human spirit, in Proverbs 20, 27, and it's, and it's the place for God's word to come in, in Psalm 119, 105, and it's like John the Baptist uh, was a lamp, I had a lamp for God in John 5, 35. And you put all these verses together, and if your lamp is lit, or your human spirit 
is alive with the oil of the Holy Spirit, then you have to come under divine government. I have to come under divine government. And the first thing I do when I come under divine government is thank God for my justification, thank God for my sanctification, and then be ready to be sanctified progressively through doctrine, through discipline, through trials, and through grace on earth. But the one thing I must do is never, never enter into the sins of the tongue because they are on the top list of God even if you do them against your enemies. In other words, 1 Peter 3, 9 to 12, Romans 12, 19 to 21, Hebrews 10, uh, 29 to 31 says, don't even get involved yapping about your enemies. And how many of you have spent hours in the past five years bringing up things about your enemies? You weren't supposed to bring up a thing about them except to define where they're at. Once you define where they're at, where they're at, Keep still and pray for them. Why? Because the moment you start attacking them, you're judging them, you're establishing a new way. God has to judge you apart from grace. That's why some of you have the problems that you have, the physical problems you have, some of the reasons. Some of the reasons are these, not all of them. Many physical problems have nothing to do with chastisement. But, the more, the more we understand that Christians who are all sinners, and if God marked iniquity, who could stand? Psalm 130. The, as soon as you understand that even our most vicious enemies, I'm going, to do, I'm going to define them, but I'm not going to start judging them with this tongue because I know that in the future years, God will say, that's how you wanted them judged. You didn't do too well uh, three weeks ago either, so I guess we'll start a little program with you. And I'll be very good to you. I'll use the judgment that you seem to think is fair. Let's see, what did you say about your enemies? Well, I must be fair to you, so I will just... Uh, judge you just the way you want them judged. So if you're praying, they'll be hurt, and maybe I've got to hurt you. If you're praying that they should be smashed, then I'm afraid I'm going to smash you. Now remember, that's the way you wanted it. You have, you have defined it, and I'm just doing what you have defined. How many understand that? Well, why are we bringing this up? Because this is the heart of Romans. See, the moral man in Romans 2, 1 and 2 was without excuse, but he started judging the immoral man. You would swear to God he had a right to. I mean, those filthy sinners out in overt sins and he was a family man. Of course he had a right. Oh, no, he didn't. Because he was going to be judged for seven things on his own, which would take him to hell. Then the religious man says, that moral man thinks his morality can get him to heaven, but I worship God. And Paul said, yeah, the six things that you're boasting about yourself are also going to be part of the reason you're going to go to hell too. See, the whole thing is that every mouth may be shut up in Romans 3.19. The immoral, shut your mouth. The moral, shut your mouth. Religious man, shut your mouth. And the law was given that would indicate to us that we have to have perfect righteousness. And that can only come by believing in Jesus Christ and becoming a Christian by grace through faith, and not of ourselves. And that's when we're given the gift of imputed righteousness. And we start to receive the life of imparted righteousness through the intake of doctrine and the Holy Spirit using recovery when we fail. So therefore, that's why the Bible teaches in Psalm 26, 12 that we're all on even ground. And if one continues in sin, he will be chastened. Now this, this doesn't give anyone a license to sin, but it certainly gives us a provision to understand the nature of God and to apply it in our experience. Next time, we will deal with the tremendous argument that the Jews had on circumcision. They really were angry at Paul. And they said to Paul, you're starting some new thing. 
And he said, no, Abraham, your father, was saved before he was circumcised. You're getting lascivious in your teaching because of what you're saying about David. No, it's all by grace. It's faith alone. Then Paul immediately tells them, starting in verse 9 of Romans 4, the full and complete meaning of circumcision. What it really means, just like what baptism means to us today. Father, dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen.